Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to our online service this morning. I, I just want you to know you've been prayed over. Uh, we pray over every video we put out that God would use it to magnify His name, to glorify His Son, Jesus Christ. We, we plead that. Uh, we want you to feel comfortable in our worship. So when we're singing, you sing. When we're praying, you pray. And, and you feel free to take notes and do all that stuff as we, we proclaim the truth of the Word this morning. Uh, we want you to feel invited. So if, if you see that comment section there, if you're watching on YouTube, you can certainly type questions into that. We have people monitoring that. Uh, just know that we're, we're here for you the best we can be, uh, but we're so thankful that you've tuned in. Uh, we ask that, that God blesses you, that God multiplies His Word, and, and that He does incredible things in your life for tuning in to Palmerdale Cross Live today. We love you, and thank you for your faithfulness. Good morning, and welcome to Palmerdale Cross. It's so good to see each and every one of you this morning. Thank you for watching those who are watching online. Happy Mother's Day. We are blessed in our church with some wonderful mothers, some wonderful ladies, and this is just a special day. So thank you to all the moms for everything that you do. And that being said, today is a special day in that we're going to have our moms, uh, some of our moms, some of the ladies in our church who are going to kind of take the, the lead in worship today. And so at this time, they are going to sing for us. There's a weight that's been heavy on my shoulders. I need you to lift me up. I'm so tired of trying to make up new excuses. Fake and smiles, trying to hide I'm only human. I need you to lift me up.
Amen, amen, amen. Happy Mother's Day. All right. I guess, I guess for some of you it's not. There you go. Hey, we're so grateful that you are here today to celebrate with us uh, Jesus, m most importantly, but uh, moms are, are going to be a, a very close second today. So if you're a mom, uh, we love you. We're so thankful for you. We're so thankful to get to celebrate on Mother's Day uh, today. We're, gonna, we're in a series called uh, Rebuilding the Family. And um, so this is what I did, Pastor Jim. You're going to love this. Brother's going to love this. Um, I'm preaching the message I would normally preach on Father's Day today. So, ladies, you're going to get most of the service off because I'm going to talk directly to your husbands for about 40 minutes today. I'm going to give you something, too. I don't want you to go home empty-handed. Uh, but we are, because uh, I know, this is what I know. I've been around churches too long. Uh, if I preach this message on Father's Day, it's going to be me and the staff, and that's going to be it. Um, everybody comes to church on Mother's Day, and then y'all go to the lake on Father's Day. Um, but we're going to talk about Jesus we're going to celebrate about what Christ has done in our life. We have an amazing uh, worship team led by some amazing ladies today. Yeah. And so we're excited, and I hope you are as well. So I want to pray, and then our ladies are going to keep leading us in worship this morning. Now, this side, let me go ahead and tell you. Uh, we are very aware that it sounds like mockingbirds are attacking the side of the building over here. You would think in a church full of rednecks, we would have already gotten that handled, but it will be handled before next Sunday, I promise. Don't ask questions about how it's done, all right? Let's pray, and then we're going to continue in our worship. Lord, thank you so much for the chance to worship today, for the chance to lift up our voices to the King who is alive, to the King who is able, to the King who is eternal. God, thank you so much for allowing us to praise you because you are good. We praise you because you are great. We praise you because you are mighty. We praise you because you're wonderful. We praise you because you're never caught off guard. We praise you because of your holiness. We praise you because of your righteousness. We praise you because at the end of our day, you are the only thing that is everlasting. You are the only thing that is actually holding us together. You are the only thing that is sustaining us in our world. So, Father, we praise you today. And we pray that as we worship, that we, we would allow our hearts to be overwhelmed, that, overwhelmed by the goodness of God. That as we sing songs, that we would be in unison together. God, we want the, the choir that is the church of Palmerdale Cross, we want them to, to outpraise the heavens around you, to outpraise the creatures around you who have never tasted salvation because they were created in heaven. They've never tasted forgiveness because they didn't. Be, they weren't born in a broken world. They, they've never seen what it means to be redeemed and to taste redemption. So, for God, Father, we pray that as we worship, God, that we would exalt your holy name. God, thank you so much for gathering with us today. That when we walked into this building, your spirit was already here. Father, we love you. We're so thankful for you. It's in the name of Christ that I pray and believe. Amen. Thank you so much for being the hands of God. One of the, my favorite things that we um, got to do this morning is that one song because if it wasn't for the church family and being the hands of God to young mothers, older mothers, anybody, then um, you know it would be hard. It would be so hard. So I just wanted to thank you all for um, just saying an encouraging word, being sweet, um, and listening um, because life is very hard. So as a church family, I would love it if y'all would stand with us and sing um, and worship our creator.
been such a special service for all of us. I know um, we've just been so blessed by this church and especially all the mothers um, that are in here. I, I can speak, I mean, just from, from my heart. There are so many women in here that have led, led me, led um, all these women and led each other and helped each other in so many ways. And I want to say thank you for that. I just wanted to read um, just this scripture. Um, and Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. She took on the gift and uh, loved our Lord um, and helped raise him. And if it weren't for moms like Mary, then we would not have a risen Savior. And I just want to say thank you.
Amen. So every year we, we ask, how can we honor moms uh, in our service? Um, so we've taught with some different moms throughout the years. And, and so we had a couple of moms say, stop giving us flowers, they die. Stop it. So we've done things. We've had the VIP room set up before, and we've done through a lot of stuff. So this year, um, I, I got with our men's ministry director, and I said, hey, what are we doing for moms? And he's like, bro, I got you. And I was like, all right. And then he called me back, and he's like, we had cookies made. And I was like, you made cookies? No, no, no. We had cookies made. And I was like, I don't know what that means. He's like, dude, I got it. And then he showed up, and he's like, hey, cookies. And he had cookies designed, and he did it all, and he's, a, he's an awesome guy, and he wanted to honor moms because he said this, he said, roses die, but sugar goes straight to the hips, and that's what we're here for today. <laughs> um, so we want to honor our moms today, so this is what I want you to do. Um, if, if you are a mom in this room, I'm going to ask you to stand up right where you are. If you're a mom, stand up. Maybe you, weren't, maybe you weren't given the ability to, to have children, but you're an aunt, you're, a, you're a, a godmother, you're a lady that has given your life to loving on other people's children. If that's you in this room, I'm going to ask you to stand up. I've got some helpers who are here this morning. Um, they're going to be bringing by candy. Don't worry. This is, think of this like communion. Um, we've already blessed this. So if I hear rappers rattling throughout the sermon, I will, uh, I'll look past it. Um, my big helpers here, they're studs. Will you give everybody that's standing, will you give them a cookie this morning, guys? Ladies, from the bottom of our hearts, we thank you. Uh, we know it's an amazing gift to be a part of a child's life no matter if you birth them or not. Um, if you, when you grab a cookie, if you'll sit down, that'll help our guys uh, not double back and triple cookie. All right, we ain't got enough that y'all get two or three of them, all right? Once you've got one, just go ahead and have a seat. Thank you, Paisley. Paisley, come this way, girl. Okay, come this way. Swing, swing this center section right here. And we're, we're really excited today. I didn't ask permission, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, we, we found out uh, a couple of, of days ago um, that one of our favorite redheads in the room, Miss Emily, is actually expecting a baby towards the end of this year. So, yeah, very exciting. Did every mom, lady, there's one more back there, Miss, Miss Pauline. Oh, and, and Miss M, yeah. All right, yo, got it, flight. All right. All right, kids, bring my cookies back. Y'all ain't taking them home. I mean, I mean, we love children here. Thank you, guys. Thank you for all your help. Tell you what, Jackson, I'm going to ask you to do something really important. There are a bunch of ladies, there are a bunch of ladies back where y'all are going. Will you make sure everybody that's serving in children's ministry gets a cookie as well? Thank you so much. All right. Everybody got a cookie. All right, y'all follow Pastor Matt out. He's going to take you back to where you go. I need a Bible. Grab your copy of God's Word. Go to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. Um, so I read this text every time I do a wedding. Um, no matter what kind of wedding it is, I read this text. This is the foundation. So we've been in a series called Rebuilding the Family, where we recognize that the number one issue in our culture is not politics. The number one issue is not fandom. The number one issue is not financials. The number one issue in our area, in our place, the number one issue is that the family has been beaten and attacked and attacked and attacked. And 
we have lost the undergirding of family inside of our churches. Um, the churches are now relying on other people to minister to their children instead of mamas and daddies in the home. And so we've been talking about this now for a couple of weeks. Uh, today we're going to talk about the apex of the family. It's the relationship between the husband and the wife. So if you are married in here today, I'm talking directly to you. If you have been married, um, and maybe your spouse has, has gone before the Lord, um, I'm still going to say things that are incredibly relevant to you. If you are not married yet, um, you haven't been married, you're young, you're a teenager, whatever, um, I'm going to help you uh, by giving you the foundations to grow and, and be the man or the woman that God's called you to be, so that in the timing of the Lord, you're able to find the helpmate and find the person that God's built for you, and it's going to be an amazing thing. So I had a pastor friend of mine do a lot of research on, on how to keep romance inside the marital relationship. Because let's be honest, like uh, next Sunday when you see me, I will be celebrating uh, my 12th anniversary. And for some of you, that's a, a dot, a fraction. Uh, but but uh, we're, uh, we're proud uh, that we made it 12 years. Uh, I thought she'd have killed me by now. Um, anytime you've been married longer than six months, what you realize is a marriage takes work. It's hard. It's difficult because there are so many expectations in marriage, aren't there? Like when you watch a Lifetime movie and it shows you like this strapping husband with abs, number one, most husbands don't come stock with abs, all right? Just, is the, we go ahead and clear that up, all right? Um, when we think through like the Lifetime, like the Christmas movie and like, we don't ride that many horses either, by the way. We just don't. Um, the, the, the man is always, they just love each other. And he's, he's buying out restaurants and jewelry stores and, and, and all of these things. And it's all this deep romantic stuff. And then what that will do is make you look over at your husband and go, and what are you doing? Right? It puts this huge weight on, on us that, uh, frankly, like, we, we didn't know we were supposed to be doing all that. Like, it's hard to keep the romance going. Because let's be honest, sometimes it's easy to be complacent. Sometimes it's easy just to do the thing, the, the, the regular thing. So I had a pastor friend of mine, did a ton of research, and, and so what he did was put together a list of things that, that you're supposed to do. And, and so like some of this is for, for women and some of this is for men, but it's going to be really helpful in your marriages. You get to take this home today, all right? This is free, all right? This is what he said. It's all, all very high scientific research that he did. He said, to keep the romance alive in your marriage, he said, the husband must dine his wife, call her, hug her, support her, hold her, surprise her, compliment her, smile at her, listen to her, cry with her, romance her, believe in her, cuddle with her, shop with her, give her jewelry, buy her flowers, hold her hand, write her love letters, and be willing to go to the ends of the earth and back again for her. And gentlemen, if you do that, it will keep the romance in your marriage. Ladies, show up naked and bring food. Food is optional, right? That's, that's it. Like, we're, we're so very different in how we interact with each other. Like, it doesn't take a lot for, for men to be involved romantically, but it takes, it takes us a lot to process what it means to be romantic for the other spouse. So when we think through what it means to work on the marriage, we have to first realize it. I, I saw Tim Allen one time, he, he quoted this. He, he said that a, a good marriage is like a classic car. A classic car always needs work. Always. You're never done. There's always something that needs to be worked on. In your marriage, I don't want you to think of your spouse as like a rust bucket. In your marriage, what we think about when we think about the marriage always working on it, it means this, we're always working on ourselves so that we can be a better spouse to the person that God has entrusted to us. So Ephesians 5, the Apostle Paul is going to talk about marriage. He's going to talk about the marital structure. And in, verse, in chapter 5, starting in verse 22, he says this. He starts, he says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. 
For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. His body and his himself, its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to your husband with everything. Husbands, love your wives, as Christ has loved the church. He gave himself up for her, that she might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. She might be holy without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I am saying to you, refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Lord Jesus, thank you for this relationship, this marital relationship that we're in that, that reminds us so much about how you love us. It, it paints such a portrait about how you're pursuing your church. Uh, but God, as we look at the, the confines of marriage and what marriage looks like, we pray that we would glean well that which you have for us, that we would learn what it means to be a great spouse or maybe a great future spouse or what it means that we walk in a, a manner worthy of your name. God, thank you that marriage was your idea. God, thank you that you built the plan for marriage. So we don't have to try to make any of this up. Everything, God, was ordained, written by you. Father, we love you so much. We're so grateful for a house of worship. It's in the name of Christ, I pray and believe, and all God's people said, amen. amen. So as we think through marriage, what we have to first understand is this union of marriage was by design. See, we didn't just decide one day that, hey, we're going to start hooking our lives to people forever. Do you know that marriage was actually by design? It was intentional. When we think through the confines of marriage, when we think through what marriage is, when we think through the structure of marriage, it all goes back to God. Why? Because it was his plan. When God began creating, when God began creating all of creation, he started creating things in pairs. Uh, the old saying I learned as a child is true. It takes two to make things go right. It takes a male and a female of a different species to multiply. So in the beginning, God had created all of creation. And then he created Adam. And he took his time with Adam. Adam was, was the prize of creation. A Adam was, was built in the image of God. He said, let us make man in our image. Let, let, us, build, let us build a man in our image. And this is going to be different. This is going to be different from the hippopotamus. This is going to be different from the giraffe. This is going to be different from everything else. This is going to be different because we're creating it in the imago Dei, in the image of God. And what we see God doing is God worked in the man. What he saw was he worked in the man to complete that which was incomplete. Now, you Bible drillers, flip back to, to Genesis chapter 2. If you're new to the Bible, don't worry. Go to the very front and go to, you see, Genesis 2. You see, God created the man, and the man began to work. And, and he looked around, and he said, Lord, there's nothing for me. I see two giraffes. I see two elephants, there's two monkeys, there's two alligators, there's one of me. So God, in his infinite wisdom, began to create the helpmate. So this is what it says in verse 18 of Genesis chapter 2. And the Lord said, it's not good for man to be alone. And if any man's ever been alone, you are right here with me. When man get alone, we do dumb stuff all the time. You let a couple men to get together, and we'll do something that you women folk go, why in the world did y'all do that? Y'all thought that was a good idea? I remember when I was first getting in, into youth ministry, um, I had a, a youth council, uh, and there was a day that like all of the husbands met for some reason. It was weird. And we planned a bunch of stuff, good stuff. I mean, like, probably would have tripled the youth group in a week. You know what I'm talking about? Like, probably dangerous stuff. And we, I go home, I'm like, babe, you ain't going to look at what we come up with. And she looks at my list, and she goes, can't do that. What idiot thought that was a good idea? And I was like, um, Jimmy, yeah. 
Yeah. Poor Jimmy. Right? I, I, you give us, it says, Bible says, it's not good that man should be alone. He said, I will make him a helper fit for him. Now, I love this language. He says, I'm going to make a helper that's fit for him. Not something that might work. Not so, I'm going to make a helper that's fit for him. He says, and out of the ground... The Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heaven and brought them for the man to see what he would call them. And whatever man called every living creature, that is what its name was. The man gave names to all living stock and all the birds of the heavens and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, there was no helper found fit for him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of the ribs and he closed back the flesh. And the rib of the Lord, and the rib that the Lord had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man, and the man said this, this at last is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, because she is taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and shall become one flesh, and the man and the wife were both naked and not ashamed." So we, we have this beautiful moment where Adam looks around and he says, but there's nobody for me. And God said, all right, I'm going to make something for you. And he first surgery ever recorded, right? He puts Adam down, puts him to sleep, takes the rib out, and out of him says, this is woman. Now, I, there's a few times in the Bible more that I want to be a fly on the wall, but right here. Because I just think Adam freaks out. He's been, look, he's been having a name, all these fish. So you wonder why we call something, why is that a hippopotamus? That's what Adam mumbled when it walked in front of him. Why is this an anteater? That's what he called it when it walked in front. And there's some names we look at and go, how'd you come up with like a codfish? You just ran out of names and that's just what, what does that look like? A codfish? And God was like, okay, codfish. Like, I, what we see early in Adam is that he was incomplete and so God began to work in the incomplete because there was nothing in Adam that gave him the foundation to flourish alone. And there's nothing in you that gives you the ability to flourish alone. We need our helpmate. We need our completion. And that's where God began to work. So God worked to complete the incomplete, meaning this, man wouldn't flourish by himself. So God had to do something. Man wouldn't flourish alone. So God made the helper to complete him. God made this helper that came in and, and began to where the man was lacking, the woman would take up. Where the man was, was incompetent, the woman was competent. God made this helpmate, and we use that helpmate, and I've, I've heard ladies say, I just don't really like that word. And it's because we don't understand the word. This helpmate isn't the sandwich maker. This helpmate isn't the slave of the house. This helpmate was the created being that would complete the man that in both they would flourish. It's actually a beautiful word. So he wouldn't flourish alone and so God made his helper to complete him. And notice this union that they would be joined together in everything. The Bible says that they would have one flesh. Their flesh would become as one. That's a unique word in the Bible, that this union that they were built into would make them as one person, that before they operated independently of each other, but now they're together. I love what Adam says. He says, when he sees the woman, he says, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. I love that. Now, let me give you some, uh, this is how Blunt County would say it. Hot dog it, she is mine. That's exactly how that would come across in Blunt County. Hot dog it, she is mine. Look at that. Here we are. They were both naked and they were not ashamed. So if this is by design, if this relationship is by design, then what we have to understand is that the Lord is, in fact, the architect of marriage. God put marriage into place, not mankind. 
So when we start thinking about marriage, and, and as you know, and as I know, over the last several decades, marriage, the institution of marriage, has been under attack. What is marriage? Who can be married? And, and now it has just gotten off the rails. Like, there's moments where I think through like a saying that somebody said, I go, yeah, we'll never get there. We passed that six laps ago, right? right? We're in a place now where there's nothing concrete anymore. But I need to tell you this. The Lord ordained marriage from a man to a female. That was by his design. You say, well, Jeff, I don't know that I like that. Well, that was by God's design. And so you can be mad at me because I told you what God said, but I'm telling you what the truth of the Scripture is. That God orchestrated and made marriage in such a way that it could only be male and female together. And I'll show you why. It says... In the Bible, so when we go back to our Ephesians chapter, Ephesians chapter 5, as Paul's talking to the church in Ephesus, he's going to tell, he's going to tell the wife to do some things, and he's going to tell the man to do some things. And if there was ever a situation, and this is why men and men can't marry, and this is why women and women can't marry, because they can't, they can't operate under the constraints that God has given to them. Because he says to the woman first, now lady, this is where I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to give you something to nibble on, and then I'm going to get to the men, and y'all get to take the rest of the service off. He says this, to the women, he says, submit to your husbands. He says, wives, submit to your husbands. And I'll be honest with you, I've done way too much marriage counseling for me to sit here and pretend like this is natural. Because as a woman, you were built to grow up and be strong. You were built to grow up and be independent. I married a very independent woman. And I find myself, woman, submit! I've never said that. I've still got teeth. That's how you know. It says to the woman, it says, submit to the husband as to the Lord. See, if they didn't add that last clause, we would be like, why, what, wait, what, you just want me to, what, you, what, sandwich it? You, you just want me to go do the, no. Submit to your husband as unto the Lord. There's a spiritual component to the command that Paul is putting on the ladies. He says, I need you to submit to your husband as you submit to the Lord. Why? Because I've got something for your man in just a second. I'm going to need you to submit to. He says, so he says, wives, submit to your Lord. He says, he says, submit. He says, wives, wives, submit. So what, he, what he's asking of, of the women, he says, submit, submission. And what we understand is submission and following is unnatural to the DNA of the woman. He says, submit to the woman as, or submit to your husband as unto the Lord. And when we think through that, what we think of is that God wants the women to just sit and be quiet. But that's not it at all. You see, out of the, the surgery that God had with Adam, he took the rib from Adam. Now, you ever thought, why the rib? Isn't that weird? Like, if you were going to, like, make something out of somebody else, would you have went to the rib? All right, I mean, I did something a little bigger, stronger. I don't know. I mean, I, mean, I don't know. God went to the rib. Do you know everything God does is intentional? God doesn't do coincidences. God doesn't do whoopsies. You and I do whoopsies. Like, whoopsies, we forgot Mother's Day. Ha! I didn't. I didn't. We do whoopsies all the time. God didn't. When God took the rib from Adam, he took the rib from the side. He took the rib from the side. He didn't take a vertebrae. He didn't take a kneecap. He didn't take a toenail. He took a rib. In this portrait that God is drawing, the woman came from the rib and she should walk beside her husband. It's not this hierarchy of woman, just follow me. That's not it at all. And if that's how you lead your family, I can tell you why there's always frustration in your home. It's not what this... That's not what he's talking about. He says, wives, submit to your husband as to the Lord. So, ladies, if you've got a God-fearing husband, follow him. Follow him. Because he is responding to the Holy Spirit. He's responding to the Lord. And he is worthy to be followed. In fact, we, we read in Scripture that the evidence of holiness in the woman's life is how she can respect her husband. It's the evidence of what God is doing on the inside. So we're asking of the woman to submit and to follow. And what we know is that this is a daily task and it's a lifetime commitment. 
It's a daily task and a lifetime commitment. Because ladies, I know there's sometimes you're gonna look at your husband and go, that's what I'm supposed to follow? He can't even put his drawers in, in the dirty clothes hamper. And I'm supposed to follow him? What in the world? But listen, we may be, we may be created equal because I affirm we are. Like, I, I'm not superior to my wife. I recognize the Lord breathed into my lungs just like the Lord breathed into her lungs. I'm not superior. We were created equal, but we were created different. Men and women are created different in how we nurture and how we nature. We're different. Most men are built with a more rugged sense about them, which is why when your kid gets hurt, they don't run to daddy. Like they were running right past me to go find the embrace of a mother. It's why when we think through the emotional weight of life, women are actually much more prepared to handle that than men. I've read a lot of research for a sermon coming up. Do you know that, that women are almost three times stronger emotionally than men are? Some of you are like, that ain't right. Yeah, it is. We'll talk about it later. That's a, that's a, that's a cliffhanger for about three weeks from right now. You should come back. Everything's different. Like, our, our DNA is different. Our, our, our bone density and bone structure is different. How our muscles operate is different. Every, that doesn't make, a, it doesn't make one species more than the other. But it does make us different. And we have to recognize and celebrate the differences. It's not, there's nothing wrong. Like it bothers me when you say, when I hear people come to me like, hey, there's no difference. No, there is. And I can show you when we look at the NCAA swimming finals, when a man who couldn't qualify for the men's side of the competition won the female side. I can show you the difference that even in just anatomy, the men are built different. And that's okay. Like, I'm, it's not, people are like, there's no difference. What, do you not have a mirror? Yes, they're different. And that's okay because that's how God created Ladies, it's a daily task to submit to your husband, and it'll take a lifetime commitment. But then he transitions quickly. Did you notice how quickly his transition went? Like he went from, wives, submit to your husband as to the Lord. Very quick verse, to verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and he himself is its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to, smite, submit in everything to your husbands. He says, husbands love your wife as Christ has loved the church. So wives are to submit and the husbands are asked to love and to lead the family. Now I've had ladies go, so I've got to submit and all he's got to do is love and lead? Hang on. Because the task put on the man is a lot heavier than the task put on the woman. The task put on the man was to love and lead. See, the husband brings the same commitment to the marriage as Christ brought to the church. This idea of, I'm just going to love my wife and whisper sweet loves in her ear, that's not what he's talking about. Like, have you noticed that sometimes people say they love you when they really don't? Have you noticed that sometimes we say we love things that we really don't? That's not what he's talking about. He's not like, whisper, I love you in your wife's ear and you're good to go. That's not it at all. He's telling husbands to bring the same commitment, the same commitment to the marriage as Jesus took to the cross, as Jesus cared about the church, as Jesus cared about lost souls, as Jesus cared about all of creation. He says bring the same type of anticipation, the same type of energy, the same type of passion to the table. So what does he say to the men? He says, number one, he says you should love your wives. You should love your wives. Pastor, you're going deep this morning, aren't you? You should love your wives. And I'm not talking about, sometimes we love people who give us things. Right? We, my dog loves me. I haven't given you Bella update. Somebody asked me the other day, is Bella alive? Yeah, she's made it. She loves me to death. She would hurt herself so that I would just smile. She just loves me. Why? Because I take care of her. I feed her. I'm her person. She lives because I feed her. That's it. 
And so she loves me because of what I bring to the relationship. I bring food, and she loves me to death. So many times we love people because of what they bring to us. That's not the type of love that God is prescribing here. He's telling you to love no matter what comes your way and benefactor. He's telling you to love selflessly. He's telling you to love. And then he's going to tell you to give yourself over to the marriage. See, when you get married, the man forfeits his identity, and now he's the husband. And all that he was previously and all that he hoped to be future is all gone. And now his role in life is to be the husband of his household. And that is a loaded sentence. Because these are his responsibilities. Number one, he's got to figure out how to lead his family spiritually. And so if you're looking for a husband, you're looking for somebody to to call your boo, you better find someone with a spiritual undergirding who can lead you. And if you're a husband sitting in this room and you don't know how to lead your family, not doing it because you don't know how is not a good answer. This is what I've learned. Many of us didn't see this modeled. We didn't see dads loving in the homes. We didn't didn't see dads spiritually leading in the homes. We didn't see dads holding Bible studies in the home. We didn't see family devotional times happening. We didn't see that. And so now we're being challenged. How are you leading the family? How are you leading spiritually in the family? And we find ourselves going, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to give you three tips to write in the margin of your notes on how you lead spiritually. The first is this. Get help. Thanks, Pastor. Get help. If you don't know how to lead your family, ask somebody. Find somebody spiritual that you see do this. Come up to one of our our team, our staff members. Hey, how do I lead my family? Get help. Number two, prioritize it. This is what we do family devos on Tuesday nights at at the Oates house. And I wish I could tell you we've never missed a Tuesday. But I can tell you when we dedicated that time as our family, that that's our family devotion time, there's never been a more time that's under attack than Tuesday night in the Oates house. It's all the time. All the time. Something is pulling for our time because Satan doesn't want you leading your family. So get help. Make it a priority. And number three is start today. If you put it off, you'll put it off. Have you guys noticed how good men are at procrastinating? We're really good at it. I use the term, guys, you can use this, uh, when Katie asks me, have you done that? I always say, it's under advisement. It's a, she don't have to remind me every six months that I need to get back to that. I'll get to it on sometime. It's under advisement. Man, you got to lead spiritually. you got to lead spiritually. And if you've got kids in the home, you need to do that publicly. Number two, protect your family. He says, you're going to love like Christ has loved the church, and the the way to make that happen is you're going to lead spiritually, but then you're going to protect your family. This is a physical protection. This is an emotional protection. This is a spiritual protection. Man, you are guarding your home. Number three, you invest in the family. So many dudes understand how to invest in a 401k. I know so many dudes that know how to invest in their hunting season, in their golf game in their fishing game. They know, hey, Bass Pro Shop, that's where I invest. You got you to figure out how to invest in your family. Where you make sure that the people under your roof know their priority number uno and everything else is tertiary. That as we lead our families, man, we, we are investing into them. We also care for them. We care for our families. Deep care. Not this 30,000 feet, yeah, I care about my kids. No, no, no. I'm talking about care that you're there. Too often in our communities, we have absentee fathers where dad's not in the home. Dad, there's no more important person in the family than you. I'm seeing this in my boys right now. Uh, There are times where Katie would tell the boys, don't do that. And you know what they do? They look at me. Like somehow I'm going to be like, no, babe. No, let them do that. Like I'm going to, you know the phrase? Say it with me. Happy wife equals happy life. They don't know that yet. They don't know that I'm going to side with mommy a hundred percent of the time. They don't know that yet. They're they're learning. They look at me because they want to make sure that I'm going to 
I, I'm going to agree because they have recognized that there's something different about dad. So we have to care for our families. Men, sacrifice over your families. This isn't fun. This isn't fun. You ever had that golf trip go away because you had to sacrifice? My kids go through shoes like most people go through chewing gum. You try, like, I feel like we're buying shoes every other week. My kids have huge feet. We're always buying shoes. You, you sacrifice for your family. You sacrifice for your family. You, you take a lower priority in the home so that your children can flourish. Now listen, don't go too far. Like, listen, I know parents are like, we sacrifice for our kids and they all got 13 iPads, 14 four-wheelers. That's not what I'm talking about. Don't spoil your children. That's not what I'm talking about. Because we, well, you know what happens when you spoil children? They become spoiled adults. And they're the kids you see on CNN that need a safe space. Right? That's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about sacrifice for your children so that they can flourish, not so they can be spoiled. We want our families to flourish. We don't want them to be entitled. So there's, there's balances there. Uh, number next, uh, be selfless. There are times where I have drugged myself, Mark Brady, to the zoo when I didn't want to go to the zoo. I've seen the, he- the elephants and the hippopotamuses. There, there are times that I go eat Chick-fil-A for the umpteenth time. I don't want to go eat Chick-fil-A, Donnie. I don't want to go eat Chick-fil-A. There's times where we're rebuilding. My, my Caleb's into Legos. And I wish we were super gluing Legos. I really do. I've tried to convince him of that. Let's just super glue it. It'll be together forever. He don't like to do that. He wants to break it so that we can build it yet again. You gotta be, as a parent, you've got to be selfless. You've got to be selfless. Because you get such a small window to make a difference in the life of the people God's placed in your home. 18 years sounds like a long time until you realize you're in the middle of it and the end of it's coming soon. So, husbands, be, be selfless. Love your wife. Love your wife. He's nourish your spouse. How are you setting a foundation for nourishment? How are you building a ground where she can flourish? Where she can grow intellectually, spiritually, emotionally? How are you setting that up? And then number H, cherish. I meet so many people that take their spouses for granted, and at times, I'm one of them that I've met. You ever taken your spouse for granted? It's hard being married. It really is. If you don't cherish your spouse, what you'll do is you'll take advantage of your spouse. And I've done way too many marriage counseling sessions where I've sat down with a husband and wife who are just frustrated. We've got to get to the point where we realize that we're placing expectations on people that God's never placed on them. We think we're going to have this Hallmark-style marriage, but you're not an actor and neither is your spouse. And no matter how cute and romantic it looks on the big screen, it never turns out that way in reality. Marriage is difficult. Why? Because you can write this down. I am difficult. The biggest problem in my marriage is always me. It's always me. Really, that's what my wife says anyway. No, it is. Like I'm, when, when I'm frustrated in marriage, 95% of the time it's because of expectations I've placed on my family that I never communicated to them. And if I don't communicate expectations, nobody can meet the expectations. And sometimes I place expectations that are way too high. Because it may, again, look good in a romance show on TV, but it's a terrible practical way to live. So he says to the, to the man, he says, I want you to love Jesus. I want, you to, I want you to love your wife as Jesus loved the church. And that's how he did it. The Lord selflessly gave of himself to build up the church as the man should selflessly give to build up his bride looks a little easier to just submit and follow, doesn't it? 
Sometimes men are like, hey, we'll just take the option that they gave to the woman. No, your shoulders were built for the load, not hers. One of the things we need to see in our country is men leading. There's been such an attack on men. So, so men, I've been hard on you. I've been hard on you. I, I, I want to I leave you in, in, with a good thing. Here we, here we go. Here we go. Stop believing the lies that the culture has said about you. You were built the way you were built and be unapologetic about living out your function. And I'm not talking about like, listen, I'm not talking about like toxic, man. Like, listen, if you go around beating people, you've got a problem. That's not biblical. If you go around and you've got to be always right and you're flexing your muscle all the time and it's my way or the highway, then check yourself because you're not right with God. But there's nothing wrong with being a man. There's nothing wrong with being a masculine man. That's how God created you. Do you think that, that God could build, like, the kids I'm watching today walking around, like, I, like, I'm like you, you gonna go face Goliath? You gonna go face the bear? No, God created men to be men, and he created women to be women. Don't be ashamed to live in the function that God created you, because when you don't, you're living unnatural and you're lying to yourself. So, I'll be honest with you, there's times I let my boys be boys. And sometimes it drives some of y'all nuts. At any point, you can see my two in the floor wrestling. At any point. In fact, it's probably happening right now. Dude, they're just they're over nothing. No, they just go. And I'll be like, okay, like, you going to stop them? I'm like, well, if one of them gets hurt, we'll stop. They're boys. That's what they're doing. They're figuring out what it means to be a young man, and they've got all this energy, and they, ah! I'm not going to stop. Now, I'm not going to let them, like, I don't let them bully one another. I don't, you know, we don't go too far. But it's letting them be who God created them to be. And, man, it's okay in this culture to be who God created you to be. Don't feel shame because you were a man. God created you that way. You can't lead your family by being effeminate. You tracking with me? You can't lead your family by being effeminate. You will only lead your family by being the leader that God's established and created for you to be. Number C, the Lord established the marriage to prosper. The Lord established the marriage to prosper. That's why, that's why the Bible talks about divorce like it does. It talks about divorce like it shouldn't happen. It, it says that when we think through the word of God, it, when, when Paul's talking and he's, he says, he says, husband, love your wife as Christ has loved the church. He gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water so they might present the church in splendor without spot. He says, I'm talking about, I'm talking about Jesus in the church. But then he begins to talk about marriage again. In verse 30, he says, because we are members of his body, therefore a man should leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. He established your, your marriage to prosper. He established your marriage to win. He says these two people become one. They leave and cleave. And he says the two become one flesh. One flesh. One flesh. And there's no pulling that back apart. For your marriage to be successful, it has to be, has to be a biblical marriage where the man follows after the Lord with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength and the wife submit to the husbands as Christ. I know marriage is hard. I know that because I live in one every single day. But I can tell you, there's no greater relationship that God has ever given to us on the planet. Now, obviously, the relationship between, between God and, and us and his salvific work is, trumps our marital relationships. But I love being married. I do. I can't imagine being, like, I'm not in the shape, Kevin, to go back to being single. I'm just not. Like, I know round is a shape, but I'm not. I'm not. Some of you guys on that single market, I look at it, I'm like, that looks exhausting. I'm not there. I love being married. I love, like, when things go right, I love being the one that calls my wife and, and like, hey, you won't believe what just happened. I was caller number nine on the radio. 
I love that. I love being able to come home and, and talk to my wife about my day. I love that. But listen, every marriage takes work. So if you're married or thinking about being married, or maybe you've been married, you recognize that what I'm saying is true. And listen, not every marriage is perfect. In fact, I'll argue that there's probably not a marriage that's perfect. And sometimes there's bad husbands. And sometimes there's bad wives. And sometimes there is grounds for divorce. That doesn't mean you're less of a person. That doesn't mean you're doesn't mean any of that but what it does mean is that we've got to figure out how we're going to submit before the Lord and be the person that God has created us to be submission to the Lord I'm done here the Lord established your marriage to prosper and the secret to that is relying on Christ to be the center of your marriage it's the hinge point Jesus. Jesus. What's the secret to a great marriage? Jesus. Cosmo would probably say something else. But I don't know if you noticed this or not, but most magazines have a great article or ads being sold to divorce lawyers. So I wouldn't take Cosmo for everything he puts out. The secret to a healthy marriage is Jesus. It takes a man going, Lord, you've placed this burden on me to lead my family as you lead the church. And I recognize quickly, I ain't ready for that. But I know it's on my shoulder, so Lord, I need you to show me how. When I got serious about this, and I wish I could tell you, 12 years ago when we got married, I had to figure this out. I didn't. It's still a work in progress. Of, of Lord, I, you've placed the burden on me to lead my family, and I don't really know how to do that, Lord. I don't know how to make that happen. I don't know how to make our family prosperous. And as I begin to open up in the vulnerability before the Lord, the Lord has shown out. He has given me insight in what it means to love my wife as Christ has loved the church, to love my kids as Christ has loved the church, to give my life over that they may flourish. Because I want Jesus to be the center. I want Jesus to be the center. Do you know that the only way Jesus is the center of if, is if he's the center of your life? If you don't have a healthy relationship with Jesus, Jesus won't have a healthy relationship with your marriage. And I've met so many young couples, and I've actually seen more people saved in marriage counseling than I have not. Because we get in there and t- start talking about this very thing and I, we recognize that the biggest frustrations they have in their marriage is that neither one of them are saved. And I've seen so many people come to Christ through marriage counseling. They came in talking about how pitiful their spouse was and they walked out a newborn child of God. Amen. So maybe the rub in your marriage is that you need to start praying for your spouse to get saved. There's nothing wrong with praying for your spouse to get saved. Now listen, if your spouse is saved, don't keep praying that, all right? Some of you are like, my spouse is an idiot. He needs saving twice. That's not how that works. That's not how that works. You need to be praying. If you've got a spouse, somebody you love, pray for them often that they would taste and see that the Lord is good and they would follow. So if you're a, a lady in here, welcome back to the tent. Welcome back. I know you've been mentally escape for the last 20 minutes if your husband if your husband isn't the spiritual leader that's leading you start aiding him to do so but be careful because you can't make him want something that he doesn't want and it would be better for you to pray over your husband than it would be for you to push and prod for him to be the man you want him to be Because when men are pushed in pride to do something they don't want to do, they'll build resentment and frustration. So instead of you changing his heart, why don't you turn him over to the Lord 
and pray that the Lord would begin to change his heart. Now, I'm not telling you you don't do anything. No, I, I, th- I still think you, hey, babe, we're going to church, let's roll. I still think you'd be proactive in pushing that, but don't, don't be so aggressive that he builds up a wall of frustration and don't want anything to do with you. And in that case, ladies, you become the spiritual leader, and that's unnatural, but sometimes it has to be that way. And in those instances, you pray. If you're a man who your spouse doesn't follow, she don't need you playing the Holy Spirit. We good at that, aren't we? What you need to do is followed by me sleeping on the couch, right? No, listen. As the man, you, you pray. You pray. And you begin to walk it out. Not talk it out, walk it out. And when you start spiritually leading, she'll see a difference. And when you start praying for your, your bride, you'll see your whole marriage start to turn. You'll see your whole marriage start to turn. Only when Christ is the center. Only when Christ is the center. I want to pray over you right now, right where you are. I don't know what your lives look like. I don't know what your marriages look like. I don't know what your family looks like. I don't know the chaos that happens behind your closed doors. I don't know any of that. But I know today this is a very true statement. If we don't hold tight to the teachings of Jesus and place him at the center of our life, we will constantly live distracted by our world. We'll be distracted as employees, employers. We'll be distracted as husbands and wives, as fathers and mothers, as church people. We'll be constantly distracted because Jesus isn't the center of our existence. So today, before we pray over our marriages, I wonder if we could pray over Jesus being the most important thing in our existence. He tells the women, he says, submit to, the, to, submit to your husband as unto the Lord. And he tells the men to lead like Christ has led. Each one of those commands is wrapped in who Christ is. If Jesus isn't the center of your life, he won't be the center of your marriage. And you'll spend your life fighting for the awe, fighting for that important seat when it was never intended for you to sit in. It was always intended for Jesus. I want to pray over you, Lord Jesus. I pray over the folks sitting in this room and watching online. Lord, that their hearts would be first enamored with you. Father, teach us what it means to have you as the center of our existence. Teach us what it means to live. Galatians 2.20, where it says, I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who lives, but it's Christ that lives in me. In this life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God. Teach us what it means to to live renewed day by day. Teach us what it means to walk out our faith. Because we can't build our marriages until we build our relationship with you. So Lord, I'm praying this morning, if there's someone here who doesn't know you, that before they go home and start working on themselves or working on their marriage, that first they will give their heart and life over to you their king, their way maker, their sovereign sustainer, that you would redeem their heart and impute to them the righteousness that only comes from you. If that's you in this service, you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you'd like to, you'd like to call him Lord of all. If that's you, I just, I just want you to slip your hand up. I want to I be saved today, Pastor, if that's you. Just slip your hand up and put it back down. Yeah. Thank you. I, I want to be saved today. I want to give my heart and life to Jesus. I'm tired of being mediocre at everything. I'm tired of struggling. I'm, I'm tired of misplaced priority and misplaced awe. 
I want to follow Jesus. If that's you, I want you to, to pray this prayer with me. You have to mean it with everything you are. This is called the transference of lordship in your life. You pray to a holy God and you say, Lord, I'm a sinner. And I need you to save me. I am unworthy of salvation. But I receive it as the free gift that you've given to me. I repent of my wrongdoing. I repent of my sin. And I ask you to be God over all my days. If you just prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. If you prayed that prayer, meant that with all your heart. God is faithful. The Bible says, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We believe that's true. If you prayed that prayer this morning, I, I want you to come down and tell me about it. The Bible says, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. But if you accept me before men, I'll accept you before my Father. And we want you to be bold and proud about what it means to walk with Jesus. Maybe today's the day you come down and start praying over your marriage. Maybe, maybe today's the day, man, where you go, I'm, I'm it. You felt the tag of the Holy Spirit to say, you're it. It's you. You're the one who has to lead your family. Because if you don't lead it, nobody else will. Nobody's kicking in your door to lead your family. It's you, men. Ladies, maybe today's the day the Holy Spirit said, hey, it's time for you to submit. God's placed a, a man in your life that is faithfully leading you. And at every chance you're, you're trying to undermine or, or thwart, maybe today's the day you say, all right, Lord, you're right. Whatever the Lord lays on your heart, we want to open up this altar for you to come down and make a decision. Maybe today's the day you partner with our church. Whatever it is, we want to give you a moment to respond. Lord Jesus, have your will and way in this benediction. God, that the saints would respond, that those who are lost would be redeemed, those who are wayward would be called home. Whatever you have in this time, in this space, we give over to you. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. And all God's people said, will you stand and sing with me?
you may have a seat for just a second. Our ushers are coming in to take up our morning offering, and we're going to get you out of here in just a few seconds, we promise. So you get to go spend all of the, the Mother's Day festivities and doing all the things you've got planned today. Celebrate your mom. The best thing you can do is honor their faith um, as you live out. If you're, if you're like me and your mom's gone, um, it makes today a little bit different and makes you feel a little bit different. And so know that, that you were in my prayers early this morning when I woke up and I said, today's going to be some hard day for a lot of people. Um, so we, we've prayed over, over you today, um, recognizing it's different when mom's not here. It's a different world, and so you've been prayed over. Um, I'm going to ask these guys to take up our offering. Lord Jesus, thank you for the chance to give, that we get to honor you by, by giving. And God, we're so, so in love with you that, that when you ask us to, to be charitable, when you ask us to be generous, God, it's not a burden, it's a joy to walk with you, recognizing that you're taking such a small fraction of our income and when we cooperatively give together, we're funding missionaries around the world that the gospel may go forth. Thank you so much for the chance to give. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. They did so good. Our, our lady-led choir praise team did a, a fantastic. I can't, yeah. I can't wait to see the Father's Day of the all men. That's going to be a special one, too. The bar's been set. That'll be a special day, too. Can't wait for that. Hey, as you go today, remember, go with God. Everything you do, everything you say uh, matters, and so we want to walk with Jesus. Happy Mother's Day. Make sure you're reading your bulletin. A lot of things coming up, a lot of moving pieces, fundraisers coming up. We've got students going on on youth trips. We've got uh, our, 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 what we call our, our VBS model. It, we call it uh, PC Kids Camp. It's right around the corner. Summer is almost here, so we get really busy. So in that piece of paper you were handed when you walked in is a lot of really important information. And the greatest thing you can do for your church is read it and be where it says be. All right? As you go, go make much of Jesus. Tell your mom and them we love them, and we're so thankful for them. Y'all go with God and have a great day of worship. What an incredible moment of worship we just had. Thank you for staying with us to this point. We're so thankful for people who, who watch what we're doing. And we want to invite you to join us live in person at 4950 Fawcett Road in Pinson, Alabama. Uh, we invite you to come and, and, and experience what we do in person and see our praise team live and, and all of that. 
Uh, so you're invited to do that. We hope that you would take a chance right now to give to Palmerdale Cross. Part of what God calls us to be as his stewards, as his people, is someone who, who gives back. And you can do that on our website. There's a link in the video below, palmerdalecross.org. You can give right there and continue to further the kingdom. All of this, all of this content takes so many hours every single week, and our tech team does an amazing job. So as you give and you give to our church, that, that enables us to keep putting out information like this. I know that we love you. We're here for you. If you have any questions for us, you can email us at info at palmerdalecross.org and we'll respond to that. We love you. Thank you for tuning in today. Have a great week.